Where are we? I don't know. I might even have to do my introduction. In which case, hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my June 2021 reading wrap up. Here are some books, not in any particular order. I haven't done a wrap up for a while because I've been busy doing other shit, so I'm gonna whiz through them. Dane reads. The Spike Milligan Letters, edited by Norma Farns. This was a four out of five for me. Actually really interesting. I'd been putting it off for a while, expecting it to be a bedtime book, because letter collections usually are, you know? But this one was actually really fascinating and showed you quite a different side of Spike Milligan as well. Uh, he's famous for being part of like the show, the team that made The Goon Show. Uh, he was an early vegetarian, like an outspoken vegetarian, although not vegan, sadly. A bit of a racist as well, unfortunately. But um, yeah, this was a four out of five and featured very little to no racism. Then we have Close, Close, Clothes, music, 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 boys, boys, boys by Viv Albertine. So this is non-fiction, a rock and roll memoir. She was the guitarist of The Slits um, and did various other bits and bobs as well. Um, like she knew Sid Vicious, she was in a band with him before he went and joined the Sex Pistols. Uh, she dated Mick Jones from The Clash. Um, so there's just like a lot of name dropping and stuff here, some really interesting stuff, some good feminist themes as well. I was given this book by my friend Juliet of The Tired Dressmaker and I will now be passing it on to my friends Dave and Amanda because uh, they were sort of involved in a similar scene at the time as well. But overall it was a 4 out of 5 for me and definitely worth reading if you want to know more about like rock and roll history and especially, especially like punk rock and DIY rock, you know. Then we have The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis. So you probably know of this because of the Netflix show. It was a very good read. Um, the Netflix show, it was a real true adaptation of this. Like I don't think, I can't remember there being any scenes in that that weren't in the book. And I can't remember there being any in the book that they missed in the show. Even all the dialogue was pretty much line for line. So the only thing really you get here is that's different is Tevis' writing style, which is cracking, to the point at which I want to now read everything that he wrote. And also you get to see a little bit more inside Beth's head as well, which was quite cool. Overall, really fantastic, 5 out of 5, would recommend. Then we have Owl and Bound by Zoe Brooks. So this was sent to me by Isabel Kenyon, who runs Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. Uh, this is a poetry collection, I did enjoy it, I, I didn't uh, tab anything out to review, but it was one of those where like all the poems were good, um, but none were particularly great, so I liked most of them, but I didn't love or hate any of them. I'd probably give this a strong 3.5 out of 5, uh, airing towards a 4. I'm just going to read you one of the poems so you can get a feel for her writing style. So, there's nothing to see. I have taken off my body and hung it on the wardrobe door. It has become too much for me. I am tired of pulling it on each morning, rumpled by sleep. I have worn it so long it has lost its shape. Threads have caught and drawn, patches rubbed bare, each fold a place for shadows to hide. I pass the mirror in the hallway and there's nothing to see, nothing to catch on the parquet floor, nothing to mark the doormat as I walk outside. Okay, then we have these two. So this is uh, the Hugo winners 1963 to 1967 and the Hugo winners 1968 to 1970 by Isaac Asimov. Uh, obviously he only wrote the introductions and stuff, so he, none of his work's actually in it. Uh, there are some good authors like Harlan Ellison, Anne McCaffrey, uh, Paul Anderson, Samuel R. Delaney, that sort of stuff. Uh, I found the first one 63 to 67, it was pretty poor to be honest, I gave this a 3 out of 5. Uh, 68 to 1970 I gave 3.5 out of 5 and particularly enjoyed Riders of the Purple Wage by Philip Jose Farmer. That story alone would have been a 4.5 but then it was kind of dragged down by some of the others. But it was nice to go and visit Pern and you know, read some of these authors who I'd never read before. I just have a problem with awards ceremonies and find they don't necessarily pick out the best books and I think that this is a great example of that. They were just okay, but hey ho, I ticked them off. And finally, we have Others by James Herbert. So this book, it's kind of like a detective novel but with supernatural elements in it. The main guy runs uh, an investigations agency. Um, he was like born with physical deformities. Um, there's like a little bit in there as well about like reincarnation and that kind of stuff which didn't really need to be in there to be honest. There's enough in there with like the ghosts and uh, the people born with the deformities. Uh, and he's trying to track down this woman's child. Um, she thinks that when she gave birth to it, the uh, doctor said it was dead, but she doesn't think it is. And then uh, a clairvoyant gets involved, all kinds of stuff goes on. Some brutal murders and all that kind of stuff. Big climax at the end. Probably a four out of five for this one. It's probably now my third favorite James Herbert book behind The Rats and The Fog. Um, and I think I've read it 
at least half of his books now. So I uh, definitely would recommend this one if you've been thinking about it. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you, and that is Children of Dune by Frank Herbert. I don't know why I said Dune instead of Dune. I said it the American way. Uh, this is the third book in the Dune series. I was a little worried going into it that I might not remember it because it had been so long since I read the first two, but I sort of fell back right back into it. It wasn't too difficult to follow. A lot of fun. I gave it, I would say, a four out of five. I enjoyed it. So uh, if you've been thinking about reading more of the Dune series, definitely do, and I will be doing so myself very shortly. Uh, then I read a lot of smaller books, so I read, here we have uh, The Terry Pratchett Diary by Terry Pratchett and Friends, aided and abetted by the Discord Emporium. So this is literally a diary. Um, I know why I've still got this there. Just thinking to myself, sorry. Uh, this is literally a diary, but um, it's interesting because it has a bunch of uh, quotes in it throughout it from the Discworld and also some different essays from various people who kind of knew Pratchett. And what's cool is you can use this for any year, you know? Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't say like Tuesday, January the 1st or whatever. There's even a, a February 29th that you can delete as appropriate. But actually it was very moving. I kind of knew to expect that going into it because of the reviews that I'd seen and I don't normally read reviews, but I think I think I saw them because I, there's a few different versions of the Discord diary and stuff. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't like duplicating myself. Someone's car alarm's going off, but it's fine. And uh, yeah, four out of five. Like as I say, very moving. Uh, then we have The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This was my bedtime book for a while. I gave this um, probably a two out of five. It was like pulling teeth. There were like two paragraphs in it that I thought were really beautifully written. That's really annoying and I bet you can hear that beeping. We're just going to have to put up with it. It's possible that it's at the... Uh, there's, oh, it stopped. There's um, a garage opposite, like uh, mechanics or whatever. Um, and it's happened before where something's gone off there and it's just gone off all night because it's a business and there was nobody there to turn it off. Anyway, uh, yeah, two out of five. It just really wasn't interesting at all. Um, I just forced myself through it, which is a shame because I've really enjoyed all of the other F. Scott Fitzgerald that I read. Then we have The Vampire Vanishes by Willis Hall. So this is a cute little book. Um, it's like a children's book about Count Alucard, uh, the vegetarian vampire. So I used to read this series when I was a kid. and. Um, you know, I've been kind of finishing them off or whatever, or rereading back through them again, but I'd never read all of them as a child, and this was one of the ones I'd never read. So I didn't have that um, nostalgia value, but I did still think it was pretty enjoying, uh, enjoyable and quite well written. So I gave it like a four out of five. Then we have The Heavenly Host by Isaac Asimov. This is a sh science fiction short story. I guess aimed at kids. It read like it was aimed at kids because it was kind of quite dis condescending in the way it was written. Um, also, you know, very short, Christmas themed, religious propaganda, avoid at all costs. Um, you know, I'll get no, I'll give it a two out of five. Um, but it's easily by far the worst thing of Asimov's that I've read so far. Then we have Five Lose Dad in the Garden Centre by Enid Blyton slash Bruno Vincent. It's actually by Bruno Vincent, and uh, he basically takes like the famous five books, and I think he's done some other ones as well. Uh, he did A Christmas Carol 2 Contagion, which actually wasn't very good. But uh, he takes like classic story ideas and then reimagines them. So this is the famous five as adults. They go back to see their dad. He's accidentally blown up part of the house with his secret laboratory. So they go off to get him a shed at the garden center. Um, probably a week, four out of five, but it was quite fun. Some great little one-liners in here and it would be perfect for like a Father's Day or a birthday present for your father or something like that. Uh, then we have two that I picked up from the uh, Wickham Art Centre Big Arts Market as part of Books Art Week. So we have Psycho Gran Issue 1 by David Lynch. And uh, this is basically a comic about uh, an old lady, a very cantankerous old lady who goes around um, doing all sorts of stuff, basically. Like she takes on Godzilla, for example, in this. And uh, yeah, it was good. It was funny. Four out of five. My only complaint was that it was, you know, short. But there is an issue too. Uh, which my friend Amanda currently has, and we're going to swap over. I got this signed as well. Uh, I'm just going to pop this over here. I also got this, and this one's signed too, and this is High Wickham and It's People Through My Eyes, a scrapbook of growing up in Wickham by Mark Page. Mark Page is a local photographer. He's also the guy who took my author photo and the photo that's on my band's cover as well. And this is literally a scrapbook of like some of the people and places in High Wickham. And it was really a strange read for me because some of it, was like from before my time, so it's kind of interesting to see what the town was like before I got here. Some of it was um, quite like nostalgic because there was places that are now closed that I remember and stuff. 
a few of my friends throughout it as well, like the art centre was in it, uh, the road I live on was in it, although you couldn't quite see my house, but it was just around the corner. And yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, and he's now working on a follow-up of like musicians of High Wycombe, which is very exciting. But yeah, I gave this a four out of five. My only qualms really were that there were a couple of spelling mistakes here and there, but the guy's a photographer, not a writer, you know, and the photos themselves are wicked. So um, yeah, very cool. And this is one that should be going on my keep pile. And finally we have The Moons of Jupiter by Isaac Asimov. So this is the sixth book in the David Starr series. And uh, it's basically like sort of science fiction, mystery slash political intrigue, intrigue and stuff. I like the way that, oh no. That was keeping one of my, one of my bookmarks from my reviews. Um, I like the way that each of these books have like built on each other and you can kind of, you know, especially towards the beginning, there's a lot of callbacks to the previous ones, although, in doing so, there were a lot of footnotes saying like, see this book, see that book, which was kind of annoying, I'm not going to lie. But uh, overall, probably a week four out of five. It's not the best of the Lucky Star books. Um, I mean, the first one in that series is called Space Ranger, and it was probably one of my favourites. I would say it's like my joint favourite of the series. Of the four or five I've read, I might have read all six of them actually, I'm not sure. Um, but that obviously, because that's the first book, it's probably the best one to start with, so I would definitely recommend that. And I would say, I mean, you can read them out of order. Um, maybe don't, but you can do, you know. Um, and yeah, it was uh, definitely worth a read. So week four out of five, but very good, and a review coming soon. Okay, so I read uh, Prelude to Foundation by Isaac Asimov, which is like the first book in the uh, Foundation series, although it wasn't written first. Uh, so it's kind of like a prequel. And it's really interesting, so we get Harry Seldon as like a young man and we discover where this like science of prediction comes in. The idea behind the foundation uh, is kind of complicated to be honest, but basically Harry Seldon is developing this plan to be able to predict like human activity and stuff. So yeah, I gave this one a 4 out of 5, although I did feel it got a little bit weaker towards the end. It was probably about 50 pages too long and I wouldn't have cut anything at all from the first half, so that tells you a lot about it. Then I have lots of these small things, so I read The Buddy Holly Story by World Records and EMI. So this came uh, as part of like a vinyl box set, and it's just like a short history of Buddy Holly's life. It was actually really sad. Uh, 3.5 out of 5 though, but I would be interested in reading like a full length book about Buddy Holly. Uh, the reason I can't give that any higher is just because it was so short. And then we have some zines. So I got a uh, Weird Mask, issue number 14, so this has some uh, Matt Wall, Steve Donahue and Regina Sinclair from Regina's Bookish Library, and it, again it's a zine. Um, the thing with zines is they're always kind of almost deliberately low quality. There were a few pieces in this that needed editing, like just the grammar, there was some bad grammar in it and stuff. Um, and like we're talking like the wrong your and your and things like that, so um, I don't know. It was also, I mean, it was kind of bizarre as well, which, which was good. So there was lots of stories about like sex and like a guy having sex with a mad spider lady and all this shit. Uh, probably a week 3.5 out of 5 for this, but still cool. Uh, then we have Creeps issue 31. So this is basically like a comic. Oh, hello, my pasta's boiling. So this was basically like a horror comic. Uh, there was like a Lovecraft story in it, a few others. Generally pretty good. Another week, 3.5 out of 5 I think, but um, still worth reading. I won't be taking out a full subscription. But uh, both of these were sent to me by Regina St. Clair of Regina's Bookish Library. Uh, she also sent me Black Magic, which is one of her novels. And this was a 4 out of 5. And the reason I enjoyed this was because it was like no frills indie horror. Uh, it was unpretentious. Just a good take on the um, the story of like people making deals with the devil, um, which is always something I find quite, quite interesting. And there was a nod to Robert Johnson and the deal he supposedly made at the crossroads. Uh, things like, there was like weed mentioned in it, for example, which it can be kind of cringe when people write about it. Uh, I think Regina did it quite well. And there was a twist at the end, which I didn't see coming, although I feel as though I should have done. But overall, I was pretty impressed with this. Nicely put together. I think she said, in her little note to me, I think she said it could have maybe benefited from more editing. And I don't really think so. The only thing that, I mean, there was like one or two minor typos, I think, that I spotted. And like really minor. Like I think one of them was an extra space or something like that. Um, although one thing that did happen is this guy gets rid of his phone and then he gets a new phone and he gets a call from somebody and it's like, well, how do they know his new phone number? Wasn't really explained. Um, but yeah, overall, did enjoy, four out of five. 
All right, uh, last couple of books for the month, unless I forgot to film some, which I bet I have, because I always do. So here we have Stage Fright by Garrett Boatman. Uh, this was sent to me by Regina of Regina's Bookish Library because I entered and won one of her competitions. Woohoo! Uh, this book is like sort of late 80s horror, right at the end of like the pulp horror boom. Uh, and this is actually the first time it's been reprinted since then. Now, I have a problem with this book. So the concept of the book is basically this rock musician uh, has started to create dreamies, which are like dreams that he creates and then beams into people's brains, basically. Uh, but throughout the introduction to this and throughout the novel, it's never once mentioned that Isaac Asimov created the exact same concept with the same name, like 40 plus years earlier. Uh, so it feels a little bit like, I'm assuming he didn't know, but even then it's like he didn't mention it in the introduction and it's been like 30 years, so you'd think somebody would have pointed it out, but hey ho, so it kind of felt as though it had been done and then he was just taking somebody's idea without crediting them, um, which is a shame. So because of that, I gave it a three out of five. Other than that, it was okay horror. Um, it's also got some stuff about like schizophrenic blood uh, and schizophrenia that doesn't really pass the 2021 woke test. So uh, yeah, and it, it, other, th other than that, it was just like a pretty standard, like it read like indie horror, uh, like self-published horror. So I don't know, it wasn't particularly good. It was okay, uh, and that's the best I can say of it, uh, but a full review of that is coming. And then I read Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. So this has been very hyped on booktube and whatnot. I would say it probably doesn't quite live up to the hype, but it's still a pretty decent read. It's basically the oral history of a fictitious band and uh, it's presented a lot like Rant by Chuck Paul in it, which is another oral history. Um, quite a speedy read, you kind of whiz through it because it's not these long paragraphs, it's just these like, you know, it's like dialogue from an interview or whatever. It breaks the fourth wall at one point to do like a shocking twist, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it was it was a four out of five for me. It was pretty good. Not like amazing slash mind blowing. It won't be on my top books of the quarter or anything. But I am glad that I read it, and I'm glad that my friend Amanda gave it to me. So there we have it. Those are all the books that I read in June 2021. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.